And let me read second I mean first Corinthians. Okay, that was made to first Corinthians chapter one. That's really chapter one. Yeah, that's that's really touching a touching story. But it's a touching story of how divinity meets with humanity. See, God is real. God is real. And he wants a personal relationship with us. That's all. That's why we're here. That's why we're in the world. That's what I mean. So when we are not doing why we're in the world, then we're in the world for nothing. And it's amazing that our, in our hearts, everybody's heart, even those who don't care nothing about God, there is a desire in their heart right now, a longing. They don't understand what it is. That's a thirst. They know they are searching for something. They search in different kinds of religion. When they are frustrated, not finding that peace, they go into so many things. Drugs, prostitution, sex, addiction, alcohol, just to, something to just feel that hope. And when that's not enough, they go into crimes, you know, going to just doing things to want to hurt people. Because people want to just be known, they want to be find relevance. But they start finding relevance in different ways. Because in every man is that hope that nothing else can feel apart from God himself. So until God comes into his rightful place, we are empty. We are nothing. We are zero. And that's what it is. So read 1 Corinthians and see what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So today I'm talking about glorying in God's grace. Glorying in the grace of God. You see... God has issued a calling. And in 1 Corinthians, you see two different kinds of calling. Paul talked about himself being called to be an apostle. From verse 1, said, Paul called to be an apostle. There's a calling that makes you be who God already wants you to be. And he also talks about the entire Christians in, in Corinth. They said to the saints, when he was talking about the people to whom he's addressing the letter, he said to the saints in Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. So there's a call to sainthood and there's a call to service. Call to sainthood is to be who God wants you to be, to be a child of God. The lady talked about that invitation. So when Jesus comes to you personally to knock the door of your heart, what he's doing is he's issuing you a personal invitation. How much will you treasure an invitation from Obama's family to come have dinner? But you say, no matter how great that is, you know, that's a great thing. <laughs> wow, that's a great invitation to have to White House. I'm sure you're going to be excited. I'm sure you will not forget the date. You understand? And but you see, it's different because when God calls us for an invitation, He's not calling us for a one-hour dinner time. He's not calling you to a visitation. He's calling you to a lifetime of relationship. 
And it's not just the God of America. It's the God of the whole universe. And you can imagine that as big and great that God is, he issues a call to his people, to us. And Paul is saying that, now, imagine that kind of calling that God called you to either be a saint, which is the first step, and then to be an apostle, to be, what that means actually is he called you to be his child. To be a saint means to be children of God, who are holy people of God. And then, once you come and you answer that call, he gives you an assignment. So he calls you first and foremost to be his child, and then he calls you to be a servant, to be doing something in the kingdom. So that's basically the calling that God has given us. And that's where many of us are hungry. We are hungry for our calling. And until God calls a man, you're just going to be roaming about, just doing whatever you think you should do, but you don't know what you are called to do. And that's what happens to people's life. Look on the street, people in the marketplace, people in the park, everybody walking around every day. You see that happen every day. People going everywhere but not going somewhere in particular with their destiny. They don't know what they want to do with their lives. They are hungry in their heart, even though they look all good and dress all nice, but deep inside there's a hole, there's a hunger, there's a thirst in everybody's heart. And that thirst is placed there by God that only God himself can feel. So when you are called, Paul is saying, when God now calls us to sin good and to do something for him so that we find our purpose in destiny, he said that calling didn't go to the wealthy. Okay, maybe you are very wealthy. But you see, God has not issued his call based on how much money you have in your pocket. I'm glad God didn't do that because he wouldn't call me. <laughs> I'm glad God didn't use how good looking you are to, to choose you, to call you. I wouldn't be qualified. I'm glad God didn't use what background you come from, what kind of family, you know, dynasty, which, which dynasty you come from, which family line you belong to, the Bushes or the, the Dark dynasty or the Kardashian family. God would not use that. If God used that, then those ones should be the saints, should be the apostles today. Because you mentioned that name, everybody knows the name. You mentioned the Clintons, you mentioned the Obamas, you know. But God would not use that. And it's so amazing that there are people in those families who are still hungry, who are thirsty. They don't know why they are here. They don't know why they are living. And very soon they are tired of life. They want to quit. But you see, what, is grace, what the grace of God does for us is that the grace of God calls us regardless of who we are. And this is what Paul said. That when, Paul, when God calls us, he calls us into greater usefulness. Because we were nothing. We were nobody. But he called us to be somebody. Wow. That's what the grace of God does for us. It brings us from, as it were, the dung hill, and it comes to bring us to sit among princes. That's what God does. So the grace of God is going to pick a man from the dung hill, and he's going to place him to sit among princes. Wow. That is grace. That is the love of God. And come to think of it, it's not because you deserve it. And you say, well, he called us, picked us from that dung hill and placed us to sit among princes to make him somebody out of us. He says, not many wise are called. Those who are wise, the philosophers, they should be the best saved people if God chooses to use wisdom. But as a matter of fact, it is their wisdom that is their reason for not being saved. Many of them, the wisdom they have is why they are not saved because they know too much. They have all this knowledge about the world they live in, but you see, they are disconnected from God because that wisdom stand between them and God. And you see somebody, they have traveled several times out of this, out into space and out of space, and they haven't found God. But I've not left where I am, and I have found God. Do you understand? It is because God cannot be found by how much ability you have to travel out of the world to go looking for God. But God comes to you exactly where you are, a little boy in a little village. That's what I used to be, a village. And right there, God found me and he called me. He says that call is not based on who you are. It's not based on how big your account is or how good looking you are. It's not based on the advantages you have had in life. As a matter of fact, it's not based on how holy you are. We are not holy. 
If we are, look at when Jesus came. The, the Pharisees were the people that kept the law all their lives. But Jesus didn't care nothing about them. When he wanted to choose his disciples, where did he go to? The fishermen. Wow. He went to the fishermen. He went to those guys who have not been to school. Because God is about to do something. Look at what he wants to do. He wants to put the wisdom of man to shame. He wants to disgrace the, the wisdom of man. He wants to disgrace the wealth of, of man. He wants to disgrace the nobility of man. That look, you think because you are rich, you are somebody, I'll tell you who is somebody. I'm going to raise out of this stone, praises of God. I'm going to raise out of people who you have abandoned, whom you have despised, and I'm going to make something out of them. Even though you think about them as a nobody, look at what the Bible says. It says, when God calls you, he did not call those who are rich, who are, who are wise. But he called who? The despised, the foolish, the weak. You're weak, he still calls you. You're foolish, he still calls you. You are poor, he calls you. You are dirty, sinful. <laughs> He's looking for you. He wants to call you. And that's amazing about the grace of God. And Paul is saying, looking at himself, he said, he didn't get saved because he knew so much. He got saved because he knew nothing. Until he was knocked down to the ground on his way to Damascus. You know, Paul was this guy that was going to persecute everybody, kill Christians, and bring them in chains. But that day, all of the things he knew about the Lord didn't save him. But that day when Jesus chose to reveal himself to Paul, that was when he got saved. So the salvation of God, the call of God that comes to us is an invitation from God, the God of heaven and the earth, and He's calling us, not because of our badges, not because of our credentials. Amen. As a matter of fact, He's calling us because we have no CV. <laughs> so that when they say, okay, can you bring your CV? You say, I have nothing to write there. Have you been there here? Sometimes I wish I have all these awards. And when I'm writing my CV, and they ask about your award, I have none. <laughs> We shall do. But I'm glad God is not looking at that to, to, to accrue to be anything. And look at what he did. Because there's no wisdom in us, because there's no power in us, because there's no righteousness in us, because there's no, no greatness in us, no nobility of any sort. Look at what he did. The Bible says, Jesus became the wisdom of God for us. Jesus became our righteousness. So it's like Jesus took our place. There's a story of Billy Graham that uh, Billy Graham, the big evangelist, you know him? Billy Graham. He, he was running around Iran and got a ticket. was over speeding and surprised. And about that man was still run. <laughs> we were speeding, you understand what I'm talking about? Okay, we all do. Anyway. So he got a ticket for over speeding and he was taken to the, I mean, when he we went to appeal it and all that, and they said, no, you can't appeal this, you're going to have to pay. The judge says, you have to pay a dollar for every mile he went over. So it was ten dollars because he went ten miles uh, over the speed limit. That's a lot. Anyways, so he said, okay, you're going to pay ten dollars. So, you charge, pay ten dollars. And then the judge now said, because the judge knew him, like, this is Billy Graham, he decided to say, okay, but you see, what I will do is that I will pay for that $10, however, because I know you. If you have broken the law, you are guilty, you are, you are sentenced, but I'm going to pay for it. So he decided to pay the $10 and also invited Billy Graham to dine with him. He decided to say, it's an honor to see you today, and so let's go in my house and eat. So he decided to do all that in his own account. And Billy Graham sharing that story says, that is the story of the grace of God. That what we cannot do, look at, look at grace. Grace is Jesus becoming for us what we could never have become by ourselves. So Jesus became for us what we could never be saints. What we could never be righteous. What we could never be holy. What we could never be instruments of God's grace. That God will find in us the people that He can use to manifest His grace to the world. We can never be that with everything that we have and what we are not. But Jesus decided to be that for us. That is grace. Grace is also Jesus doing for us what we could not do 
by ourselves. Amen. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, verse 9 says, verse, verse 9 says, And you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Verse 10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Amen. But now you are the people of God. So once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. That's what we used to be. Nobody. That's what we used to be. Not a people. But now we have become a people. But not just ordinary people. We became people of God. Wow, that is amazing. So Jesus became for us he gave us a status before God. That's what it is. He gave us status. So what is your status? Status. He gave us a standing before God. You know standing? To have a standing. If you are invited to Baba like we're talking about and you are there, you need a standing to be there. Who are going to ask you, who are you? But imagine that you are going to have to go in there with Clayton. They're not asking about who you are anymore because they know the person you are with. And that's what Jesus does for us. So we couldn't go before God with who we are. So he decided to go before God on our behalf. So when God sees Jesus, he sees us standing before him. So he gives us status. The second thing he did for us with grace that Jesus did for us, he gave us the power to do what we could not do by our own effort so that we can be used of God. Anybody can be used of God. Amen. You can be used of God. It doesn't matter what your story used to look like. Look at that story of that girl. Anybody can be used of God. She's a powerful musician, a powerful gospel singer today. Look at where she started from. And everybody in the world that you have ever seen that God has used mightily have their beginnings with grace. And you can also do that. So is there somebody here today who is feeling like, I'm a nobody, I cannot do so much. God is saying no. I've made you somebody and you can do so much because of God. Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can. Somebody say, I can. I can. Say it very well. I say, I can. Say it again. Say, I can. I, can. I want you to say it like you really believe it. Say, I can. I can. Because Paul really believed it. And he didn't just believe it. He lived it. Look at where he started from. A persecutor and then He's just this guy going everywhere, sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel. He was beaten. He didn't get discouraged. You know, this is something he never liked. This is something he was going to kill other people for doing. And now he's doing that same thing himself and he pours the whole of his life into it. I can. Somebody say it again. I can. Okay. Do all things. All things mean all things. Whatever God has called you to do, you can't do it. I don't care where you are in your Christian level today, but right now I am seeing people who are evangelists. That God can turn you from where you are and make you an evangelist. And make you a declarer of the gospel of Jesus. He can make you a declarer, a proclaimer of the truth of God. That many people through you will be trooping to the kingdom of God. That is how God can turn a man's life around because of his grace. That's what he can do for you. You may not see the connection today like hmm, me. And you look at yourself like Moses did. Like, oh, how can I be the one that will speak? I'm a stammer. I do not know how to talk, but God said I'll be with your mouth. That is grace. God is going to do something marvelous with your life. Today you think your life amounts to nothing, does not look so significant. But when God gets hold of you, so tell somebody when God gets hold of you. Okay. When God gets hold of you. You know when God gets to get hold of you? When God catches you. When God gets hold of a man's life, God will do with your life what you never thought he could do with that life. So Paul said, when he finished, he said, Look, I will boast, but I will not boast about anything. In fact, I have nothing to boast about. What will I boast about? Let me ask you, do you have something to boast about? Money? Status? I'm talking about the things that qualify you before God. Even if you have these things, the best place they will bring you is before men, not before God. You understand? Not before God. But before God, what do you have? 
to boast about except his grace. So Paul said, you must boast. If you must boast, you boast in the grace of God. If I will glory, I will glory in the cross by which I am saved. If I must glory, I will glory in Christ who gave me and made me somebody. Who gave me opportunity to serve. Who gave me this calling to be his child. I want us to bow our head and as we ponder on the words of this song that says, In the cross, in the cross, be my glory forever.